Now I know what some of y'all are thinking. Here comes Kuro with another clickbait title just so he can name his video something. But breakdown videos are always titled what I feel like the highlight of discussion for each episode should be. And this one is no different. In fact, I feel this episode is one of the most overlooked episodes that actually has a lot of contributing factors to the very same character development problems that people seem to have a problem with. Let's check it out. <laughs> One Kuro the Artist here, and welcome back to another Ben 10 Breakdown. According to last week's poll, the majority of y'all felt that Alien Force started off really well, with at least 78% of you calling it amazing. But one of the oldest and biggest complaints about early Alien Force is that Kevin seems to come around too easily. As a child, he tried to murder thousands, took over a galactic combat ship, teamed up with Vilgax, and never seemed to feel an ounce of remorse. Then we got Teenage Doughboy over here drinking smoothies with them like they're all best friends? Yeah, that's quite the change. On paper, we don't look like such a great team either. But honestly, that change might be more justified than you think. Today's episode acts as a complete analysis of that topic, and I feel like we take it for granted and sometimes completely ignore it. I'm not saying a single episode is enough for Kevin to turn a new leaf, but early Alien Force really does make the effort to show a realistic evolution of Kevin's character in the first couple of episodes, and this episode targets it directly. Kevin is one of the most layered characters in Ben 10 because because he's constantly outrunning his past. You've got a record. You've done time in the null void for a variety of crimes. And he frequently falls into his old habits. Now if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna go swipe some of their equipment. Without friends like Ben and Gwen, it's hard not to end up like Kevin with the life that he's lived. Low overhead, big profits. Your overhead just went up. So what happens now that Kevin is trying to clean up his act? Will everyone suddenly drop everything and give him the benefit of the doubt? Is this where you turn into an alien and try to kick my butt? I'm considering it. Will his old colleagues let him go that easily? Yeah, I may be a crook, but this guy's no good. He'll stab you in the back just for laughs. Let's hear a quick word from our sponsor and then get right into the breakdown. Hey everyone, today I'm here to talk to you about this wallet. Oh, this wallet. That's right, baby. I'm here to talk to you about the Ridge Wallet. I've been using my Ridge Wallet for about two months now, and if I'm being honest, I am completely in love with this sleek, metallic design. It definitely is one to be admired. Not only does it look good, but it feels good too, especially knowing that the Ridge Wallet is made with RFID blocking technology, so digital pickpocketers have no chance to get your card information unless you take your card out of the wallet. The wallet itself is small and compact. It can fit into the palm of your hand. Didn't even know it's right there, did you? That's how small it is. Whenever you're ready to go from this ah! to this, Hello. head over to ridge.com slash the ink tank for 10% off your purchase of a Ridge wallet. And with your purchase of a Ridge wallet, you'll be automatically entered into a sweepstakes for an off-road optimized convertible 2020 Jeep Gladiator or $50,000 because I know people much prefer money than they do driving. Hmm, and remember, that's ridge.com slash the ink tank. Now let's get back to the show. On May 3rd, 2008, Kevin Big Scored had aired on Cartoon Network, written by Matt Wayne, the first of his long tenure with the Ben 10 franchise. Still on the hunt for Grandpa Max, the trio are visiting Rust Bucket 2, when Kevin suddenly steals it and runs off. He meets up with his old scamming buddy, Argent, and tries to sell it off for a special piece of technology. But is everything exactly what it seems to be? Now right off the back, this is how to do a very good noir style background. If you saw my breakdowns for parts one and two of the pilot, they tried to achieve this type of mood, but the backgrounds were way too dark to appreciate or even, you know, give off the vibe they were supposed to. Whereas this uses the blacks very smartly, you can still clearly see the silhouettes and shapes of everything. And there are parts that do have texture, which is wonderful. But this is an example of doing what they're trying to do in the most effective way, rather than making the background so black and incomprehensible. Damn, it's also a cool looking gun. I like when the nozzle has that long shape. 
He's just eating that right off the street too. Now this sets up Argent as a very skeevy kind of guy. Someone who definitely lives an underground lifestyle, but is not one to mess with. But the more you see Argent, the more he becomes kind of a joke. But either way, he always finds a way to make himself interesting when he's on screen. Guess who? Who they're doing that reflection pattern in the windshield again. They put a lot of care into the visuals and sound effects for Kevin's car in the first couple episodes. Even Argent has a warp on him when he's reflected in the window. Wow, check out this face. After all we've been through, ain't you glad to see your old running buddy? Oh, you know, those lines actually have more meaning thanks to Omniverse. I got that tech you're looking for. Octagon Vriedel says you've been vid messaging. Octagon Vriedel gets a name drop like two whole seasons before he shows up. It was probably just some random name in the script at the time, but I like how they actually took that name and made a character out of it later. Well, now you're listening. Now that I can do something for you. You are so off my contact list, man. Yeah, I love the hilarity of later Argent, but I do like this Argent too. He definitely seems to have his shit together more and really fits in with a lifestyle that he's in. He's also decently tall. He's like as tall as Kevin's car right now. How tall is he normally? Like a little, a little taller than his toddler, right? But this is like human size. I'm actually got it, got it. But I can make the connection with the guy who does. It's gonna cost you. Here's the trailer park from the first episode. Hey, Ben, look. See, this looks very much like their classic selves. Even Max, who did get a slight art style change for Alien Force. This shows they're definitely able to draw the characters in the classic series style, which is why I'm always baffled whenever they show young Ben later on. And he does not resemble this at all. They suddenly decide to give him a makeover. Same with Gwen, too. Maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, but I don't, I don't know. Also, the rust bucket's getting towed. That's kind of funny. It's so like Grandpa Max to lose one dumper than run out and find another. Oh, you know what? That's a canon in reference to the fact that this is the Rust Bucket too. I only knew that this was the second Rust Bucket because of the message boards and the fact that in Ultimate Alien when they get the Rust Bucket 3, obviously there was a second one. But I don't know how I missed that so many times. They make a canon reference to Grandpa Max getting the second Rust Bucket. So this is the event when the first one was damaged beyond repair. Which is strange because we've seen it blown up like quite a few times. But I guess whatever happened here, that was the end of it. Oh, summer was incredible. Remember Gwen? Hero time all the time. Yeah, I do think I'm gonna count that hero time. Kevin was still a bad guy. And this feels like a very natural way for them to recap what's happened in the classic series too, just to establish the format of this episode. I know you're here to keep an eye on me. So they don't fully trust Kevin yet, at least Ben doesn't. He's fine working with him together and everything, but that's just for the sake of saving the world. But I do like how they're not immediately buddy-buddy, you know? It's sweet that you wanted to fix up Rust Bucket 2. They even call it Rust Bucket 2, damn. This somehow just went over my head. I guess I don't watch this episode as much as I thought I did. They actually redrew it for the frame sliding it back into the box. But with this photo at a slightly different angle than looking at it head on, the characters in the photo turn too to meet that perspective. It's like one of those photos in Harry Potter or something. Not yet. I like that you can see the clock that Ben got the Grandpa Max message from in the pilot. Still not buying the nice guy act, Kevin. And you're right to do so, because check this shit out. You know, making this a second rust bucket is also an advantage for the writers that they can do different things with it. And people won't be like, the first rust bucket didn't do that. You know, what kind of person would just sit down and just pick apart every single detail about Ben 10 anyways? Go Kevin! Wait, so did the rust bucket 2 not be able to drive before this? Maybe that's why Grandpa Max settled down in a retirement park. The second one just broke down and he was like, well, I'm not getting a third. <laughs> I like that you can see some motion blur with the rust bucket driving away and the chair gets kicked up in the gust of wind. Was that CG? The lights are so bright, I can't tell. I only thought so because of the wheels. These look like the CG wheels from the classic series. Oh yeah, this is CG. Look at the shape of the undercarriage and how the outlines keep getting thicker the closer it is. That's neat, so they already rebuilt the rust bucket in CG. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if this is the same model with a different texture, especially just because of how similar these wheels look. Kevin? Bet you wish you had Accelerate right now. Wow. Even though this is an error, I do like the black markings on the side. And he's also activating the Omnitrix like this. Alien Force has always been super inconsistent on that. Classic straight up says you press the button and it pops up. With Alien Force, sometimes you gotta squeeze both rectangles. Sometimes you press the ones on the side. Sometimes you twist and it lifts up, which is what he tells Vilgax in season three. I guess there's just multiple ways to do it. Nice hologram for Big Chill. Although once again, it is facing us and not Ben. Ah, another unique transformation, right? No. Oh man, I forgot Big Chill starts off with the generic one, but he does get his own later. Big Chill. And it was smart of them to really slow down and emphasize how Big Chill's wings work since this is a new alien. Look at that, the animation on this is wonderful. It always seems like the thickness of the wings can transform too because of how thin his antenna get once they unfold. Oh, look at this. You can see his lower wings wrap around his waist. There goes Kevin. Yeah, this is a CG rust bucket. But look, they slow down the frame rate so it blends in very well. This one is drawn though. 
So even though we later find that this is all for Ben's benefit, Kevin's still smiling when he gets to fight Ben again. So you know he's getting some enjoyment out of this fight. <laughs> Wow, Big Chill can dodge pretty fast in the air too, just like Jet Ray. This is a neat display, but if it's on your side mirror and you have to be looking at that to calculate it, you can't be looking at the road, so that's a little bit dangerous, unless you just got autopilot on or something. Ah, Big Chill's phase ability. So when Ghost Freak phased, he became negative colors of himself, but when Big Chill phases, he becomes this cool blue outline. And his freeze ability. Now I know it always looks different, I don't know all of them by heart, so let's try to pick them out as the episodes go. Right now his freeze ability just looks like air waves shooting down, like it's actual breath. And when we cut to here, now it's become an ice funnel. And it smooths out too, which plays into Big Chill's ice manipulation ability, because later we see him shaping the ice all kinds of ways, instead of it just being a concussive burst. That's the same sound effect as the Omnitrix. Now his breath kind of looks like it was drawn to be a cloud and has that air texture printed over it. Is Ben trying to kill him? Or does he just trust that Kevin will survive this? It's also gonna screw up the RV. The one button does all. Wow, how convenient that he lands on a lower road. Or I guess Kevin's just that good. So we see Ben fade to his intangible form, which then looks like it becomes invisible. Apparently Big Chill's invisibility power in his first episode is an error, and all of his future appearances he only goes intangible. But is it even an error at this point if Kevin has to go as far as use a device just so he can see Big Chill again? Like you might as well just say that's one of his powers. It doesn't really matter if Big Chill can or can't go invisible. And look out for those missiles. Oh, they explode into a net. And Big Chill can't phase out of that. As it disintegrates though, I'm surprised Ben doesn't continue to try to chase him. And Quinn ran all the way here. He got away. How could I have let my guard down? Another sign of growth in Ben's character is when he feels his judgment was wrong, he doesn't just blame the person, but he's also taking responsibility that he's saying he let his guard down. So he's acknowledging that this could easily be as much his fault for trusting someone he shouldn't as it is for that person, you know, being untrustworthy, which I think is good. Alien Force Ben does self-evaluate pretty frequently, which is not only a great character trait, but just something good for you to do as a person in general. That was the old character. Kevin. He's different now. Yeah, we all know why you're really saying that, Gwen. I can track him from this. You kept his sweaty handkerchief? I mean, that's very convenient for them, but you know, kind of goes without saying why Gwen is more trusting of Kevin than Ben is. Which creates an interesting dynamic that Ben is a little more level-headed than Gwen right now. And I know Kevin isn't actually doing something evil right now, but at least in this scenario, from their perspective so far, yeah, it does seem like they should evaluate their stance on Kevin because they shouldn't trust him so easily. Also, check out this black stripe. So I always have this problem on Photoshop, where even though this part of the towel is drawn to be behind the hand, and this is drawn supposed to be on front, both of them are still the same layer. So when you do something like add a glow effect, kind of ruins the illusion, and you can see all of this is just one layer glowing on top of her hand. It's very brief, and you would definitely not notice it in motion. You know me, frame by frame breakdowns over here. She also seems much better and much more confident in that ability since she first tried it in the second episode. Mm -hmm, yeah. The aftermarket extras are worth a fortune. I forgot Argent actually has powers. First one we see are his paralyzing quills. You should have held out on me, buddy. Wow. Yeah, I really like Argent in this episode. Definitely not for his actions, but he's a great character. Tech dealer named Volcanus. He says he knows you. Says he wants you dead. Volcanus too, bringing back an OG character. <laughs> ah! So that's skillful and strong. He punched a rock clean in half. Kevin Upsetti. Ooh, I really like this silhouette shot. If this was a higher quality, this would be a dope poster or something. What happens when this is all over and Grandpa comes home? Where's he gonna live then? What kind of jerk steals an old man's home? That's a very good point. You know, it's not just all the tech and everything. That's legit where Grandpa lives. You hit a tracking device in the undercarriage. Kevin's good. <laughs> a light ball, or whatever you'd call it. That's awesome. <laughs> We're supposed to be keeping the planet safe from an alien invasion, and we can't keep a motorhome from being stolen? Ben's really not taking this well. But you know, everything he's saying is still pretty rational. I mean, he's right. But he's also, like, pretty livid right now. Ben's trying so hard to be threatening right now. Kevin just looks threatening. No transformation sequence, just cutting straight to the alien. This is the first time an alien is used that doesn't get a transformation sequence in the show. So far, every time Ben's become an alien, he's had one. Although this animation is reused from the pilot. This is a background I would have expected to be super dark, but we can surprisingly see a lot of it. Wow, look how many Echo Echoes there are. He's surrounded. When Ben had Ditto, I think the max he's ever had was like, you know, maybe half or even a third this size. But Ben's just casually busting out a crowd of like a hundred against Argent. 
And it's good that not all of them share the same pain either. Whoa. Ben's first named move too. It's a pretty complex move too because he clones himself as he's creating these screams and it's well coordinated too. They're moving the quills up towards this Echo Echo who takes them and redirects them over to this Echo Echo, redirecting it one more time down to Argent. Also shows Argent isn't immune to his own effects so. You know what, if he's laying down and he accidentally pricks himself. It doesn't look like any time's passed either. He was probably only asleep for a couple minutes. Did Ben have to be Echo Echo to do that? I wonder if he figured out how to detransform on command or if he's still timing out right now. But god, that's gonna be annoying. Have you ever had super glue stuck to your skin? It's like the worst. It takes days to come off sometimes. <laughs> I like how his sleeping is sort of vocoded or whatever. <laughs> This guy's no good. He'll stab you in the back just for laughs. I mean, yeah, and he has. I don't have to explain myself to you. Or you either. I'm done with both of you. See, if he told him the truth, that probably would have patched things up, but I think he's more offended that they don't trust him. And they kind of have a right not to. But you know, that still doesn't mean Kevin's feelings aren't hurt. You can tell that it seems Kevin has warmed up to Gwen and Ben more than Gwen and Ben has warmed up to Kevin. Airplane graveyard? Well, yeah, look at all of them. I wonder if they're actually speaking a language that could be translated or if they're just clicking. But this is the first appearance of the pickaxe aliens, notable for being in a few video games and also Volcanus's lackeys. That sounds like D. Bradley Baker too. Wow, Volcanus trying to be intimidating? I hear you're looking for me, Volcanus. Mirrors Kevin being in the shadows earlier. Like it's just a bad guy thing to do. Kevin Levin. Is it just me or is his suit more teal than it usually is? I feel like after this episode it gets much more blue. You left me holding the bag at the mercy of the plumbers. Ooh, not a good place to be. Stuck on Earth swapping level 3 tech to get by. So Volcanus is trapped here on Earth because of Kevin? That's a good lore anecdote. Ancient history. Ancient Ancient history, he's still fucking trapped. I have the plumber gadget you want. You want to owe me? Ooh, Kevin's ballsy for coming in here like that then. Neil. Oh. I wish I knew what these magic bands were or technology or whatever. They're really cool. In fact, it would have been neat if Volcanus had these as a part of his suit or something. You're going to pay me back for the double cross. So these bands are forcing him to not only grab onto this, but absorb it. That's interesting. I wonder how that works. This is also the thickest we've ever seen him coat something. Absorbing. Piece of Tatonite. Precious living gem in the galaxy. Now Tatonite becomes a pretty big staple in Ben 10 lore, but I think a lot of people can agree that I wish it wasn't a similar color as Diamond. Head, just because that creates confusion. Because for one, Diamond Head being named Diamond Head and him not actually being made of diamonds. You know, all these gems are looking the same, but aren't the same thing. What color would you make Tata Knight if you wanted to change it? Let me know in the comments down below. So the fact that Volcanus has all of this set up and ready to go makes it seem like even if Kevin did make the trade fairly, Volcanus was still planning on doing this. So in the end, it's a good thing that Kevin didn't give Volcanus anything. Until you came along. These frames are all blended together. Instead of them just coming one after another, they all got some type of crossfade. <laughs> Kevin's getting bigger. Sort of like what he later learns to do in Alien Force Season 3, but this is all involuntary. Ah! Does that hurt? Yeesh. So you off piece by piece. <laughs> It's also a pretty smart plan on Volcanus's part too, not gonna lie. Do what you want to me, but Ben Tennyson gets that hollow viewer. What a shining moment of nobility. Even after feeling his own sense of betrayal, he's still doing all of this for Ben and Gwen. This is a great sign of change in Kevin's character. <laughs> but he's with us. All right, so one, Big Chill's becoming invisible again. And for two, Gwen wasn't invisible, so she was just standing there? Why was Ben disguised? That whole get mad and storm off act, please. <laughs> it's like I used to do that shit all the time. Ooh, a fire gun. There she is with that grab spell again. Her signature move in the early days. Next to the shields, which there they are. Ben's breath burst just looks like drawn lines here. No type of effect at all. But what's interesting is even after he's dropped, Volcanus is still shooting and making contact with something, even though Ben's all the way over here now. Subtle foreshadowing that Volcanus's body isn't real. If you knew what he did, he stole. He rad. That's Kevin. You know, I like that Ben is starting to accept Kevin for who he is and seeing he's trying to change. But because of how well they played up the distrust for Ben, I wish we saw him come around. But I guess you can only do so much in a 22 minute episode. And I do think all the Kevin stuff from his side of the story was necessary. This is a very Kevin focused episode. <laughs> 
So she does one attack and figures out that blowing up the pickaxe aliens' weapons causes a small explosion. And then once she starts becoming surrounded, she stops trying to hurt them and goes straight for their pickaxes. And yet again, Gwen is surrounded by dead bodies. Big Chill freezes things by phasing through them. I forgot he did that in his first appearance. That seems like a more advanced move. <laughs> The ice is so cold it destroyed his suit. I do think it's pretty funny to see Volcanus like this. But also, you know, he could have some type of suit or something. He's gotta be doing this for his own leisure. Look at his little toes. Yeesh, he is huge now. So this is more than absorbing over his skin. He's gotta be mutating his body with this as well. So is this Gwen doing this or Kevin? Because at first I thought now that he's free, he can control it. But we see these magic sparkles, which is an effect that's been used for Gwen's magic in the earlier episodes. So I want to think that she's healing him somehow. What about him? What about him? Later on, Ben would not just leave Volcanus here. Definitely an Omniverse, and maybe as early as Ultimate Alien, he would have him arrested by the plumbers. But I guess right now, Ben is still just working on that one mission. He's not fully integrated as, like, a deputized officer of the plumbers and whatnot. So he's kind of just like, yeah, Kevin's right, fuck him. Another hollow viewer? Why didn't you tell me? I'm an ex-con. Done a lot of stuff I'm not proud of. Stuff that if you knew, you'd probably never trust me again. So Kevin's embarrassed about his past being a villain. That he feels like it's impossible for them to accept him being good so he might as well just keep doing bad things except this time it's he's doing it for what he believes is good reasons which adds a lot of different layers to his behavior i like that it's not what you did that matters but what you're going to do that's very forgiving of ben he's starting to come around to kevin if you found this message you must be in pretty deep well he did find this message in possession of volcanus which makes me think that this message was originally planted somewhere else i don't think grandpa intended them to get this from volcanus because like this has nothing to do with the alien conspiracy so it's actually a really good thing that kevin got a hold of this for ben because they might not have ever even seen this by now you're probably meeting some of the other plumbers kids seen so far he's only met alan he's probably assumed they're much further along in the case than they really are so you know hop to it guys you need to put together a team and with those words from grandpa max that really solidifies ben's decision start treating kevin like a legitimate teammate you know i gotta say i was really impressed with the quality of this episode this is definitely one of the least exciting ones of the series so far and it's definitely not one i rewatch frequently but you know everything just flowed together so well i really want to give this episode a five in plot it sets up and pays off a lot throughout this episode and the trusting dynamics between all of them i feel like by the end of this episode we know how each person feels about each other and where they stand. I feel like this was a very important episode to do because yeah, Kevin and Ben were arch enemies as kids and they have no reason to trust Kevin. And this shows that on Ben and Gwen's side, it's something that they need to work on and get through if they're really going to trust him as a teammate and work with him during this alien conspiracy. And on Kevin's side that even though he's trying to do the right thing, it's still hard to shake his past and, and truly do things the right way and not through his old habits. So on a surface level, and I guess from a marketing standpoint, yes, it does seem like Kevin just joins the team and all of a sudden everybody's cool with each other but i think the earlier episodes really do try to make it make sense in the universe and tackle all of the different things it would mean for kevin to join the team for them as characters and for the progression of the story and it all comes together with that final message of max saying that he needs to work together with people and build a team and that's sort of what these characters went through to decide today instead of ben being told that this is the lesson he needs to learn he first learns it on his own and then gets reassurance from grandpa max that this is what he's supposed to do. And I like the plot with Volcanus. This wasn't a straight up good versus evil plot. It was kind of just everybody sort of thinking about themselves and this really doesn't have to do with the alien conspiracy at all. It's a brief glimpse into the criminal history that Kevin had in the network of people and the lifestyle he had before Ben and Gwen. Characterization, I also want to give a five. I think I've done enough to say how well I feel all the main trio's characters were treated in this episode and their own arcs that they go through. But also Argent really surprised me in how great of a character he was. I wasn't just attracted to his writing, but how he played into the plot and had a significant role in progressing the story rather than just kind of tackling along and being the sense of humor. He also seemed like a legitimate threat, like Ben actually had to put in some work to try to take him down. Granted, yeah, this is still an early Ben getting used to the Omnitrix, but just because of the reputation Arja gets in later episodes, it's easy to forget that this is where he started off. And while I can't say the same kind of effort went into making Volcanus seem like a three-dimensional character, 
character. He does come in late into the episode, and he's not exactly the focus of the episode. If he was more of the main antagonist pulling all the strings, then I feel like, yeah, there should have been more focus on to developing Technus. Do I keep saying Technus? I mean to see Volcanus. If I said Technus before, there should have been more effort into developing Volcanus's character, but he seemed to just be another cog in the system where the whole antagonist of this episode is Kevin's past. And Volcanus serves as a reflection of the things Kevin has left behind and how it can still creep up and affect him in the future. And I think that's an effective use of his character, despite him not feeling so much of a character as himself. Visuals, it's gonna go down to a two. Despite this being Big Chill's first appearance, Ben is still getting the hang of him so he doesn't have too much diversity with his powers. The action isn't as engaging as the first three episodes have had. And while there's no need for flashy and grandiose action pieces in an episode like this, this is much more of a story focused episode than a visual focused episode. So as this episode really didn't need the extravagant visuals, it still lacks visually without them. Not to mention the animation just doesn't seem quite as polished as say episode three, everybody talks about the weather. But importance, it will rack it right up to a five. Pretty much everything having to do with Grandpa Max in this season is important to see. And as this is a very arc based series, each episode so far has been contributing significantly to the overall story and with developing these characters. And so far, it doesn't seem like you can miss out on anything yet. And this episode is definitely part of that puzzle. And entertaining, it's gonna go back down to the two. Personally, I would give this a five hands down. I very much like the whole underground criminal story here. I loved all the interactions between Kevin and Arjit and Volcanus. I loved how it started off with them reminiscing about the classic series. I loved the dynamic between Ben and Kevin in this episode, but I have to put aside my bias. This episode just isn't that exciting. Aside from getting the important info from it, it's not really ripe for rewatchability. And this doesn't quite have that Ben 10 charm infused into it. It's a great story for the characters, but a lot of people like Ben 10 for a handful of certain reasons. And this episode kind of lacks on like the exciting alien sci-fi Omnitrix mystery stuff. Can't say I see the fan base putting this episode on such a high regard, but that still leaves this episode off at a 19 out of 25. That's still a pretty great score. Alien Force seems to be on a roll so far with the first four episodes broken down. Let's move on over to the final thoughts and wrap this up. Now, normally I would use this section to wrap up all of my thoughts, but since I'm only doing one episode per video now, a final thoughts segment is kind of redundant. So I'm gonna fill in the final thoughts sections with little notes and stuff I found while editing these videos from now on. Just a miscellaneous grab bag of facts and notes and whatnot. Like for one, on the Ben 10 wiki, you could actually look at the storyboards for this episode and you can see Echo Echo uses one of his earlier designs and Ben is wearing a hoodie, which shows that they've been thinking about this episode for a long time, even before everything was finalized. I also like to point out that we do give Kevin a lot of flack for falling for Gwen so easily, but this episode is one of the best examples that it does go both ways. He got away. Wow. I mean, oh no! Also, during the Tatonite scene, McDuffie had said on a message board once that Kevin was just coding himself and not mutating with it. But I don't know if I'm buying that. This looks like a full-on transformation to me. That combined with Big Chill's power flub and the early storyboard concepts, this episode was probably put together when a lot of the show existed in this realm of uncertainty. Like they knew right off the bat that if they were gonna convince the audience that Kevin needs to be part of the team, then they better get to work on its stat. I wouldn't be surprised if this episode was written before the pilot. Probably not though, but. Anyways, lastly, Volcanus actually has this line to say about the Tatonite. The rarest, most precious living gem in the galaxy. Hear that? He calls it a living gem, which might explain why Kevin's uncontrollably absorbing it because there, at least originally, could have been some implied sentience to that Tatonite, or at least in terms that we see plant life and whatnot. I don't know. Or maybe he didn't mean that at all. I just feel like adding the word living to that sentence was pretty intentional, and Tatonite might have meant something that it didn't become later on. Anyways, let's end this video with a poll. Do you still feel like Kevin joins the team too early? Be honest. You can look for this question in the community tab once this video is out, but until then, I hope you all have a fantastic weekend. And as always, Keep it fizzy.